But anyway, <clears throat> today I'm going to be talking about what, who Jesus said he was. And this is pro, really falls in line a lot with what Stan was talking about, of course. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this comes from John 14, 6. And he, he goes on to say, no one comes to the Father except through me. <clears throat> you would think that's not a big deal, but when you think about all these religions in this world, um, you know, like the Hindus, for example, the, the Muslims or Moslems, and so many different religions. <clears throat> Recently, I was going through a, a, um, a television, you know, and Oprah Winfrey came on, and my wife and I used to watch her all the time, but not anymore. <clears throat> and one of the things she was saying, I don't know how she got off that, that tangent, but she said, there are millions of way to the God. There are millions of ways that we can uh, uh, come to God. And I thought, she's crazy. There is only one way. And it is through our Lord and Savior. It is only through Him. And so this is what we're going to be talking about today. The controversy that he had in trying to explain who he was. First of all, he says... the way, right? If I advance this thing or not. <clears throat> he says, I am. And, uh, but where did that come from? It started off in Exodus. Here we have a story about um, Moses wanting to ask the Lord, but what authority can I go and uh, set these people free from Egypt? You know, because I don't have any authority. I'm, I'm just an ordinary man. <clears throat> but this is how God responds. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. <clears throat> Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Moreover, God said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial to all generations. So he, Moses turned around and he told his people what he was going to do and what he was going to say. And the first thing that he came out of his mouth was that God's name is I am. See? And remember, think about it, but there is no other authority higher than I am. So God could not really swear by anything else but himself because there's nobody over him. He is eternal. He is almighty and all powerful. And I can tell you right now, even Church of God people have a hard time believing that our Lord and Savior, Yeshua or Jesus Christ, is in the same rank of the Father, that he is God in the flesh. And in fact, this is to us, to most of us, this is not a big deal, but there's some people that actually wanted to kill him for that, and they, in, in a way they succeeded because he, he tried to tell them who he was. So anyway, There are two reactions to people when they heard that he was saying how he was defining himself as I am. In John 18, uh, verse 4 says, Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him, so he stepped forward to meet them. And he's talking about these Roman soldiers because they were trying to, to take him into captivity. And he says, uh, who are you looking for? And he asked, Jesus the Nazarene, they replied, I am he, Jesus said. And Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. But notice, he's standing. I have a feeling that uh, Judas never really completely believed 
who he was. And Jesus said to make sure that he explained who he was, he says, I am, <clears throat> I am he. And they all drew back and fell to the ground. Isn't that an unusual reaction? They knew this man was very special. So there, are, there they are, you know, on their knees, even though they're not religious people. Even they could see that he was something very special. But there's Judas standing there, very stubborn, refusing to accept the reality that this was God in the flesh. This was a creator. This was indeed our Messiah. He didn't get it. And as a consequence, if you ever wonder, why was it that uh, you know, Judas did that? Did he like money that much? No, I'm sure he did like money, but not that. It wasn't about the money at all. Because think about it. Remember, he threw the money away. He didn't really want it. And he was trying to give it away. No, nobody wanted it. So they used it to bury him in, in the potter's field, they say. And the point was, he still did not understand that he was the great I am. Because if he did, he never would have done what he did. But he did it, and there was no getting away from it. But what I wanted you to see here is that these are two reactions about the same thing. Let's look at the second reaction. And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. So now he's talking about to the people. These are the Israel. They took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself. And he went out of the temple, growing, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Different reaction, right? So you see, the first time I read that is that I said to myself, how could he really hide himself that well? I mean, he he was right there, and, and then they were about to get him, and all of a sudden, he disappears from them. Well, remember that what he said before. No one takes, I lay my life down for you. He says, no one takes my, uh, my life from me. Like, so I lay it down myself. So... He was in charge of the whole thing. He was in charge of his death. And he was in charge of the resurrection. And that is great news for us. So, in reality, if you look at all the times that he was confronted with people that didn't believe in him, he was um, always in a position where he could have gotten killed. But they couldn't kill him because it was not his time yet. In fact, he mentioned that before. It's not my time. So let's uh, delve a little bit into that. He says, well, anyway, uh, he says, not only did he say, I am, he says, <clears throat> let's explain what that means. I am in the Greek language is a very intense way of referring to oneself. It would be com comparable to saying, I myself and only I am. These words reflect the very name of God in Hebrew. Yahweh, which means to be, or to the self-existing one, it is a name of power and authority. And Jesus claimed it as his own. So that's, what, that's where we have it. So I am the way, the truth, and the light. It's four different things that he mentioned about himself. A lot of people forget about this first one. So I needed to put that in there because he is the great I am. So when we pray to the, our Lord and Savior, don't worry, you're praying to God himself. And when you seek the Holy Spirit's guidance, you are also seeking the Messiah as well as God. You can't separate them, okay? Three and one. But they're not three different entities. They are God. So anyway, the point here is that you need to understand that I am is a very, very important 
phrase or, or term that we use or that the Jews used. It is not the, it doesn't mean that much to the Gentiles, but it meant everything to the Jews. And they didn't want anybody to be calling themselves, I am other than God. But he also said the way, I am the way. <clears throat> Acts 4.12 says, there is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. This means he is a way to God, not one of many, but the one and only way. You see, John 8, 58 and 59, more, very important, or rather, um, well, that was the first one, but Acts 4, 12, it's telling you that this is a very important term indeed, and he takes it. He takes it upon himself. It's interesting that he never used that term before, but he used it now in the time of his ministry, the time when he was really uh, owning up to what he was there for. And you and I have a purpose too, and we'll discuss that in, in short time. Hebrews 9, 21 and 23 also says, in the same way he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And isn't that what uh, Brother Stan mentioned as well? Without, <clears throat> without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That is why the tabernacle and everything in it which were copies of things in heaven, had to be purified by the blood of animals. But the real things in heaven had to be purified with far better sacrifices than the blood of animals, and you know who that is, by the blood of Christ. There, there, <clears throat> therefore, he is the way. He is the way and the only way that you can come to God. You and I cannot come to God on our own terms. We have to come to God through Christ. When you and I claim the blood of Jesus, and when we claim that uh, we want the grace that he offers us, then the doors are open to us to, re to reach uh, our, our creator. And that's very, very essential. So when he says he was the way, he meant more than that. He didn't mean he didn't say, well, I'm, like Oprah said, I am one of millions of ways. That is so ridiculous. Boy, she got me mad when she said that. It just made my skin crawl. But you know what the audience said? Amen. I said to myself, these people have no clue. They have no clue who he was. There is only one way. There's only one way, and that is through the Lord and Savior, Yeshua, or Jesus, if you like. There's only one way. And then I, then I wondered, how is it that all these people are saying amen? Don't they get it? Don't they understand she's very wrong? Well, first of all, there's a lot of people that are what they call today influencers. People that, you, that, that are followed in, <clears throat> on the internet and on, uh, on, on uh, uh, the social media, and they influence people because when they say something, everybody just says, oh, I guess it's true. Oprah said it. You and I don't have that kind of authority or that kind of pull, you know, but I'll tell you what, there are a lot of ministers today that are saying the same thing she is. They are minimizing not only the Sabbath, but Yeshua himself, our Lord and Savior. It's like he is, you know, something extra thrown in there. And to them, he's still the little baby Jesus, you know, that he's never grown up. And to others, he is this, this man on the cross that hangs on their neck. He's dead. So either he just got born or he died. But in reality, he is the way to God. So when you and I think about reaching the Lord, 
It is through him and no, no, no one else. So be assured of that. Many religions try to find different ways to come to God. We can't work for salvation because it's what cheapen the gift of grace that comes from the blood of Christ. There is no other way to find salvation. We just can't get around it. There, <clears throat> so there is only one way, and that is through the Lord. And all these religions that say, oh, we, we believe uh, in, 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 the, in the God of the of the Arabs or, or the Muslims and so forth. And, and that uh, and, and that he is the only way. And they, they, in fact, Muslims don't really say that Jesus was not, they don't believe that Jesus existed. They just say that he was just another uh, prophet. You know, that's just another prophet. And he's not even in upper rank uh, as to uh, the the prophets they, they believe in, and that's a that's a very big shame, you know. I like to believe that in the in the end, a lot of people will come to understand how wrong they were. But I pity those pastors, those ministers, who have cheapened grace, who have preached the same message that Paul that uh, Stan was talking about, <clears throat> and that was that. We, we don't, you know, we have grace and we can sin. It is okay, you know, it's not a big deal. The Lord has forgiven us. We claim, uh, and, and they come up with the new terms, you know, all the time. I've always heard as once saved, always saved. But now we find out there's all kinds of grace there. That's not what the Bible talks about. So just bear in mind that there's going to be a lot of ministers that you see today that are making not only tons of money, but they're also misleading the people. But the Lord will call them into great damnation when the time comes. But that will not be uh, to people like you and me. <clears throat> we, we, we respect our Savior for what he is. But remember, he says, I am, but he says he was the truth, but now, or rather the way, but now he says he's the truth as well. Now, let's talk about what that means as well. In John 18, Pilate, Pilate some people say Pilate, I don't know. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? <clears throat> Jesus answered, you say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is truth? And when he said this, he went out again to the Jews and he said to them, I find no fault in him at all. And he was right. In fact, as you remember the rest of the story, <clears throat> he said, you know what? I had the options, and I'm paraphrasing, to release one of these prisoners. And uh, so I could release him if you want. He says, no, we want Barabbas. And this guy was a sinner, you know, all his life. But they wanted to free Barabbas. There's a lot of movies and stories about Barabbas, but uh, I don't think we heard very much of him, so we don't know what is the truth about him. <clears throat> we like to believe that he uh, he changed his ways, but you know, all the the point here is that here is Jesus saying that he is the truth, and I'm bearing the truth. I tell it like it is. You know, if enough of us tell them tell the truth, people will hate us. For quite a while, I, I think uh, even my own family disliked me because I told them the truth. They didn't want to hear it. Uh, I, you know. You, may not, you and I may, may think, and I would say naively, that if we just tell people the truth, they'll just fall on their knees and say, oh, you, you're right. You know, you know, what was I thinking? You know, it's not true at all. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> There's one dear lady that I work with. She's a Christian. 
<clears throat> but she's a Christian, but <clears throat> you know she had very Protestant ideas, and she said, and she goes, you know, when when um, we're getting close to Christmas time, <clears throat> you can imagine where I'm going with that. She comes up to me and she says, quite you know, very, very clearly, she says. Joe, did you do all your Christmas shopping? And I go, <laughs> here I am trying to avoid a confrontation, you know, and it's almost impossible to do that. So I said to her, I did all the shopping I'm going to do. And you know, that was a little vague for her, so she didn't like that idea. Did you get your wife something? What does she care what I gave my wife, you know? But she said, did you give your wife something? And I go, she's got everything she needs. And she, by this point, I could see her getting red. I'm not getting this across. Do you do Christmas or not? No. And I said, well, then why didn't you just tell me? Well, because if I told you, you probably would be very angry with me. No, I won't. And I said, well, that case, let me tell you what I think. And I basically told you, told her the story. And I told her all the story about how Christ was not born, you know, uh, uh, for, as, as the birth of Christ was not the most important thing, but rather his death. Of course, it was important that he, that he was born, but his death was more important. And that nobody's keeping the, the time. And I explained to her that December 25th was not even the time he was born and so forth and so on. Well, anyway, long story short, I'm not going to preach that one, that one again. But she goes to me, I'm so sorry that I asked. <laughs> so you see, nobody really wants the truth. They don't really want the truth. They're kidding you. You know what they really want? They want you. They want your their words out of your mouth. That's what they really want. I've come to that reality. They can't, They want you to say what they believe. And if it doesn't come out the same way they believe it, they are not happy. Uh, so some people might say to me, you know, you took, you took, you were trying to take the easy way out, the cowardly way out. But you know what? I've had so many confrontations before. It just gets old. So I try to avoid it. You know, I, I really do. I try to avoid it. But if I can't avoid it, I will meet it head on. And I would just say to people, if you really want the truth, then I will tell you. But if you don't want it, don't even bother asking me because I will tell you. So anyway, the point is, our Lord and Savior Jesus, he was the truth and he wants us to be truthful as well. I believe that there's a lot of people that are not ready for the truth. But when they get ready and the opportunity arises, you need to step up. In John 8, Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you re remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So isn't that a little bit of controversial? Because what is the truth? Isn't that what people are wondering? Because isn't that what Pilate also said? What is truth? Well, he's trying to teach people the truth as God intended for him to cut to do. So when he says the truth will set us free, what does he mean by that? In John 8, 33 and 34, he says, we are descendants of Abraham. And they said, we have never been slaves to anybody. What do you mean you will set you we will we will set me free? You will be set free. See, so they, they, they thought, hey, we're free people. We're not slaves. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave is not a permanent member of the family. But a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free, you are truly free. 
And if, if you remember nothing else from this sermon today, remember, you and I have been set free. We're free from sin. Yeah, we, we make mistakes now and then, but we don't practice sin. We are not enslaved to sin. We don't have to do the bad things we did in the past. The, the devil has no control over us. And I assure, I assure you, the devil really gets angry when we tell the truth. And he has a big laugh when we don't. And there's a lot of churches this weekend that will be preaching nothing but lies and nothing but a doctrine that is feel good and warm and fuzzy and the whole bit. That's not the way it goes. Sometimes those of us that preach the truth, we got to step on a few toes. But don't worry. Just as we're stepping on a few toes, we're stepping on our own as well. Because we're surely not without fault either. We are imperfect people serving a perfect God. So <clears throat> this is what he's trying to explain to the Jews. You are slaves. You're a slave to sin. So the old uh, covenant was, I'm not going to stop sinning. I'll just get another animal and kill it. And then it'll be okay. So then I, at least I'll, I'll be okay until I sin again. That's not what the Lord wants. He wants us to change. He wants us to be free, free from the, being a slave to sin. He doesn't want blood. He doesn't want sacrifice. He wants obedience. And if you want to know what obedience is all about and what we should do to obey, just go back and look at all the teachings of the Lord and Savior. So, in essence, we are <clears throat> free from the power of sin, free from the power of sin that is all over us and controlling us. But does everyone... Everyone want this kind of freedom? No. I'm sorry to tell you the truth. Not everybody wants to be free from sin. They just want you to stop judging them. They want to give in. They want to give in to, to, to whatever is bothering, you know, controlling them. It's so much easier, isn't it? To be able to, to, to just keep doing your own thing. And, and feel and not feel bad about it. But if somebody comes up to you and tells you, hey, you're on the wrong way, brother. They don't want to hear that. They want to let you, they want you, you to tell them that, okay, maybe you're doing wrong, but you know what? You're still a child of God and God has forgiven you. Not only your sins from the past, but all the ones you commit and even now. So don't worry about sacrifice. And here again, as I'm, I'm quoting pretty much with, Stan was talking about, so he and I were on board, and I promise you, we don't sit together and, and put these things together. It is God that does it, you know. It is a heavenly Father, and I don't think I'm presumptuous to say that. But we should not be surprised if family or acquaintances get angry at us for telling the, the truth. But we must always tell the truth if we're asked about it. And uh, <clears throat> but sometimes I, I try to gauge people. Do they really want the truth or do they just want me to just say something? You know, I don't know. Some people are not ready for the truth. But you know what? One of the ways that I can tell you how the Lord, that our God and our Savior is very real to us. Is that I see people changing all the time. People that I didn't believe could ever change have changed before my eyes. And not because of me, but because of the word of God and because of the power of God. And that, and so if you ever do the, make the mistake that I did and, and, and mention family members that I always said, oh, that person will never change. Look at them. They're, they're still the same old way. But then, but then all of a sudden, right before my eyes, they change. And I go, wow, the power of God is real. So I'm telling you now, if there's anybody in your life, in your family, that you feel will never change, 
Don't doubt it. Keep praying for them. It is the power of God that can change anyone and everyone. Unfortunately, not everybody wants to change, but everybody can change. I think we are intermediaries for, for the Lord. We are praying for them. We do intercession for people. They don't even know they need prayer, but we pray for them. And I know the Lord will hear us out. But the final thing that he said he was, he says, I'm the way, the truth, and, and, and the life, right? And so now he says he's the life. So what does that really mean? Ephesians 2, 1. Begin, and well, actually, we're beginning in verse 2. It says, and you, he had made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. In 1 Peter 3, 18, he puts it this way. For Christ also suffered once for our sins. For the just, for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Isn't that an awesome thing? A lot of a lot of our young people, I, I kind of criticize them a little bit. Uh, they use that term awesome a lot, don't they? I have an awesome phone. I have, I have an awesome girlfriend or boyfriend. That movie was awesome. You know what? There's only one thing awesome, and that is God. And the things that he's doing for us in the way that he's working in our lives. He is an awesome God. Isn't there, a, isn't there a hymn by that or a song by that? Our God is an awesome God. And I believe he is. So <clears throat> he made us alive. In fact, I will tell you now that he mentioned this in the, in the, uh, the Bible as well. There are some people dead that they don't even know they're dead. If you're living in sin, you are dead to God. Because we cannot come to God as sinners. If we have sin in us, we have to come repentant. And we have to come and beg the blood of Christ, which is the grace that we receive, that washes us away. So we are alive. You and I today that have made our profession of faith and accepted the blood of Christ, we are alive. John 10.10 10 says, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I, this is Jesus, I have come that you may have life that you, and that they may have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. So all this business in the Old Testament about the shedding of blood, <clears throat> of killing animals, all this was about sacrificing so that we could be made alive. But you can't go on like that. In fact, in Hebrews, uh, Paul, I think it was Paul that would say, I am so weary and tired of, of, of your sacrifices. And of all this blood, I'm tired of it. They never learned their lesson. They just kept sinning over and over again. Kind of made me wonder, what about these poor people, you know? It might go off a little bit of the tangent, but what about all these poor people that ran out of animals? I mean, not everybody had a thousands and thousands of animals, right? Think about it. And this is the reason why they had to come to the temple and, and uh, buy a, a little turtle dove or, or a little lamb or something, you know. They would run out. They had to go buy one. That whole idea, that whole concept of salvation or forgiveness anyway, I don't think it ever saved anybody. All that, that, that model was, was so messed up. So here comes the perfect sacrifice, Yeshua, dying for us, 
This is something he did for us that even though we were dead in our sins, he made us alive. So don't ever let the enemy confuse you and make you believe that you are still dead. We're not. We're not dead at all. We have been made alive by the Lord and Savior. And so we need to walk like that. You can't slip back anymore. You are you and I walk in step with the Messiah because he's saving us. So I'm drawing to a conclusion here. It's a little bit of a long conclusion, if you will see. So the conclusion is, but why do people lose their way? See, because I've heard the I preach this, this not not really preach, but I, I I've uh, taught this this whole thing before to other people, some of them that were lost. And this is what they say. Well, if this is all true, why do people still lose their way? You know why? And there's an answer for that. Because remember the story of Peter? How he tells Jesus, Lord, if you will, I can, I can walk. I can walk to you in, in this water. I can walk on water to you because I believe in you. And he said, well, sure, come, go ahead and come. And so he starts walking and it all, it's all good. He's not sinking. At least not until he stops looking at the Lord. He stopped focusing on the Lord. He stopped focusing on Jesus. And he started looking at the waves around him. He started looking at all the tempests and all the, the wind around him. And he said, and he focused on that instead. And you and I, sometimes we focus on those things as well, don't we? We focus on our problems. We focus on our friends, our family. We focus on people instead of God. We focus on our job. You just fill in the blanks, whatever you like. But in reality, we are focusing on the wrong thing. And this is why we lose our way. And the other question that I hear is, why do so many people not know the truth now? I mean, once we explain it the way I just did, I mean, is there any is there any doubt about this salvation through grace? Well, then why do some people don't know the truth? Well, you know what? You just when when people say that to me, I say you just stepped on your toes. Because there's not enough people preaching the gospel, and I'm saying the real gospel. And they find the truth is too burdensome for them to keep. I know that he wants me to do this and that, but I don't want I can't do it because it's too hard. It's too burdensome. <clears throat> but anybody that loves their mother, father more than the Lord is not worthy of him. Some of us, including myself, have actually <clears throat> had to turn away from our own families so that we might be able to get closer to the Lord. The, you know, the, the, there is a, a form of sacrifice on our part to love the Lord more than anybody or anything else. You can't even love your family more than the Lord. He has to come first. And that doesn't mean that you got to neglect them. It doesn't mean that, that you don't love them or care about them. It just means that the most important part of your life is serving God through the Jesus Christ. And the other and the last question that I have heard regarding this subject, if Yeshua is alive, why do people still get sick and some die before their time? And I, you know what? <laughs> I've, I've been very ill, you know, and, I'm, and Martha told, told me not to throw out a pity party, so I, I, shall, I shall not. But the point that I'm making here, I, I've been very ill lately, you know, and, and I, I'm, I'm grateful that I'm getting so much better. But there was a time that I thought to myself, Lord, I've been serving you so long. And for so much time, and I have not deviated one way or the other to the left or to the right. Why am I so sick? 
at some point I thought I was dying there. You know what? But <clears throat> but you know what? The Lord spoke into, to my heart the same thing I'm telling you here. This life, God said in my heart, is temporary. It is not permanent at all. It is just a means to an end for you and I to come to Christ. He has given us a life so that we can know salvation and help others be saved along the way as well. Do you think the Lord really cares about this body? Well, if it's a means to an end, if I and I looked, I just simply told the Lord, I guess I bargained with him and I said, you know, Lord, I, I know this body's not permanent. It is never meant to last anyway. And that's why I'm falling apart here. But um, the fact is, if you keep me alive, Lord, I will try to keep doing more and more for you. I will try to keep saving more people. There's a young man tomorrow that I will be meeting with. I'm just, I'm just throwing the, this out there as an example. Who called me while I was over there in uh, Denver. And um, he said, I've been reaching out to a lot of people. Nobody answers my, my questions. And so when I asked the church that you and I previously, many of us really attended before, when I asked those people that I've been attending church with certain questions, they just threw their hands up in the air and they said, you need to talk to Pastor Joe. <laughs> I said, boy, talk, talk, talk about writing that one off. So they gave them my number. And so I got this number from, the, from this young man and I didn't. And, and I'm just elaborating here about, uh, about a, a, a true story about a reality. And, and I'll tell you how it ends because I don't know how it ends because I got to meet him tomorrow. Anyway, so uh, he calls me and he said, are you Pastor Joe? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, I was told to call, call you. And, and he says, your son, Stephen, and your friends, uh, uh, Louis, and all these other people, they told me I got, I got the answers for you. And I said, oh, OK. And I said, uh, I don't I, I don't believe that I have all the I, I have a, a, a complete monopoly on the truth. All of us have the truth. He said, well, well, then why don't they answer my questions right? I get, OK, you know, you know what? What, what, what do you want? I mean, I, I can talk to you on the phone. So, no, I want to meet you in person, he said. And I said, where are you from? I said, I'm from San Antonio as well. And so I said to him, uh, when is the best time to meet you? Only on weekends, he said, because he works and, or something or goes to school. But anyway, <clears throat> so where's the meet tomorrow? And uh, I just want to see him ask me all these, whatever it is that he's asking me. Because after all, isn't that why I'm still here? Isn't that why I'm still alive? to be able to touch the hearts of some people that really are, need an answer. And so don't do not do as some of my, the people that you and I know, don't do as they do and palm you off and say, oh no, I don't know, I don't know how, how I can answer that one. So go ask somebody else and here's the, here's the number, you know. So I was quite, a, that, I was wondering, how did you get all of me? But the truth of the matter is, I can't deny anybody that wants the truth. And uh, who knows? It's kind of like the story of Esther. Remember the story of Esther where he said where her, her uncle, who was probably kind of a father to her, he says, who knows that you have not been brought to the kingdom for a time such as this? To save these people, to help these people in their time of need. So I have lived as long as I have, and I've, I've lived a lot of my my uh, ancestors, I can tell you right now. And I've outlived them not because I want to be able to accomplish more or make more money or or have more stuff. No, I have been kept around for the purpose, the express purpose of serving God. And if I serve God by sharing this truth with this young man, I will do it. 
but I'll let you know what, how it turns out because I have no clue what he wants to ask me, you know. And uh, and I have enough of the gospel of the truth written in my heart already, so I don't have to worry about doing a crash course in anything, you know. But you might be in that situation someday, so don't. I urge you not to tell them to call me, you know, unless at least you give them a try yourself. See if you can help them. And if you're at a loss, okay, then I'll step in. But there's a couple of verses I wanted to end with in Psalms 118, verse 22. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. You see, the, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, those four things. And because they don't acknowledge that, because people don't look at him, he is a cornerstone upon which we build our faith, our church, and all things that are worthwhile. But because we reject, people reject him, he's a stumbling block for them. Though, and what does the Lord say about that? Let it be known to all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by your built, you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And isn't this what, what the Lord and Savior said as well? No one comes to the Father but by me. That's what he said. So I have come to the Lord himself. I have come to God. And I've seen my family come to God as well. Not because of me, but because of Jesus, who is the way. He, he, who, he, who he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is all those things. And nobody can come to the Father but through him. And if you don't come to him through him, this chief cornerstone, you will fall. You will trip all over him. So when people say, there's millions of ways to God. It's a lie. And it is probably the worst lie anybody can say. Because they are tripping up. Because here's Christ. He's not going to get out of the way. He's there. And when you walk towards God, and if your focus is not on, the, on, the, on our Savior, you are going to trip. You're going to stumble on him. But he's never meant to be a stumbling block. He's meant to be the chief cornerstone upon which we build every good thing that we want to do. If it isn't about the Lord, it's not going to happen. It's not going to work. If it's about the money, if it's about trying to get people to like you, is about if it's about uh, preaching a gospel that makes everybody happy, you're headed the wrong way. The only thing that we should be uh, pre uh, considering is the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus himself. He is all these things. So if anybody ever wonders who he was, that is who he is. And that's what the only way we can ever build anything. If you want to build your faith, if we want to continue to build our church, if we want to continue to uh, help people be saved, it is only through him. We have no power on our own, but the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells in us and that we share with the people of God and those that he has sent us to, to be saved. So we will close with a word of prayer and then we'll have some music, I guess, afterwards. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we want to just thank you for this time you've given us to be together as your people. I thank you personally, Lord, for the voice that you've given me to be, to be able to share this word. And I know that you'll continue to heal me because I am a willing and 
instrument for your word. And I only serve because you have become the cornerstone in my life. So I thank you for that, Lord, and I thank you for all that you are and all that you're doing for your people. We ask that you manifest yourself among us, that you will show us, Lord, what is the way that we should go. For we have, do not serve you because of pride. We serve you because we love our Savior who died for us, even while we are still living in our sins. And I know that we will try our best to continue to do the right things because you love us and we obey you for these purposes. In Christ's name we pray, amen.